God is great. God is good. Let us thank Him for our food. Did any of you learn your meal prayer that way? Is there anybody that I just need to see if that's like just for us old people? No offense for any older folks who raise their hands. I'm just seeing, okay, so the tradition continues. And I assume y'all also did, uh, now I lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord my soul to keep. You know, do that one. If I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. I don't know if y'all know the comedian Tim Hawkins. He says that's just terrifying to teach that to children. Uh, but I was taught that when I was a child. Uh, but I want you to think that first one especially. God is great. God is good. Let us thank Him for our food. I grew up, you know, a lot of us had kind of those practice prayers. Jesus did the same thing. He taught His disciples practice prayers until they got to the point that they could kind of talk to God on their own one-on-one. -on -one. And we mouthed those practice prayers. And maybe you had one of those when you, the first time that you led prayer in the Lord's Supper. You had kind of that model that someone had taught you. Or maybe the first time you led prayer in Bible class, etc., but sometimes with those practice prayers like God is great, God is good, we say them, but we really don't know what they mean. Now tonight as you begin your expressions focus this summer, we are looking at goodness. And we're on a journey tonight to try to discover and learn more about what it means for God to be good. Now, I like in my lessons to have a biblical bullseye. I usually like to have a, a set passage for you to remember. So you can maybe just remember Genesis 1 through 3, because we'll get to that here in a few moments. But Genesis 1 through 3, and goodness shows. Goodness shows. If you can remember Genesis 1 through 3, and Genesis shows, then my hope is that you'll have something to take home from this lesson. I appreciate Richard very much allowing me to be here tonight in spite of the fact he had heard me preach and teach before. Uh, I thank the world of him and Brian. I'm just going to tell you, uh, well, Brian and I, I got to, to spend some time with him and work with him through the uh, Future Preachers Training Camp at Graymere in Columbia. Richard, I'm just going to tell you, Richard is one of the finest. I'm not saying this, he gave me no money for this. He is one of the finest young men, young people that we have ever put out of Freed Hardman and one of the finest that I've ever had the privilege of working with in our youth and family ministry program. I just want you to realize what you have in him. He could have literally gone anywhere. And he and I, I remember one day after class, we talked about 30 or 40 minutes about where he was going to go next. And I'm going to tell you, he loves this church. He fell in love with you, I think it was last summer, wasn't it, when you did your internship here? He loves you, and I'm just going to ask you to love him back. He is a special, special person. So I'm grateful that he allowed me to be here tonight and that we get a chance to talk about God's goodness. Now what I want to do is kind of talk about how do we discover God? How do we learn about God? I want us to think about, okay, goodness, what is it? Can we define it? And then I want us to look at how God displayed, or at least one example of how God displayed His goodness. Now, the, primary two, the two primary ways that God reveals Himself to us is through the world and through the Word. That when we look in the world around us, we get some glimpse about our God. Now, Psalm 19 is a great place to go to kind of summarize those two ways that God reveals Himself to human beings. The heavens declare the glory of God. In Romans chapter 1, it said that there's so much that can be seen about God from the creation that no one should have an excuse for not believing that there is a Creator that we should know there is a Creator, there is a power, there is an intellect, there is a wisdom behind this universe without ever having met Him or shaken His hand. The heavens declare His glory. And one of the things the psalmist says is even though they are silent, they don't have a spoken language, they speak a language that can be understand, understood all over the earth. So the first way God reveals to us something about Himself is in the creation. 
But even though we can come to the conclusion there is a God and we can look at the world around us and see that He is a God of wisdom and power, that He is a God of intellect and order, etc., we could conclude some things about God from the world. Ultimately, to know God more closely, we need the Word. And so God has, down through the centuries, revealed something of Himself, of who He is, of why He made us and what He envisions for us to various people down through the centuries, prophets and spokespersons. And sometimes they shared the message from God with spoken language, and sometimes they wrote it down. And because they wrote it down, we have the privilege of opening our Bibles and seeing something of what God has revealed about Himself, and in some cases where people have written down what they saw, because at times God literally revealed Himself to people. And so they wrote down, whether it's Moses at a burning bush, or other examples we have through Scripture. So, how do I come to know God? I think I learned something about God through the world, but I also learned something about God through the Word. And you're going to find tonight, as we talk just a little bit about Genesis, really those two things come together, because we're going to look into the Word of God as the Word of God describes... God's making of the world. All right, well now, if we're going to, we've, we've talked about how we discover about God, but what we're about tonight is discovering God's goodness. So as we talk about God's goodness, can we define this term? You may have some, some general things that you would come up with that would describe goodness. We could always go to, to a Webster's Dictionary, and this is kind of a combination dictionary, and come up with a some ways the word is used today may or may not jive with how it was used in the Hebrew Bible or how it was used in the Greek New Testament, but at least maybe gives us a starting place. I find it interesting that in a lot of the dictionary definitions, the modern day English definitions, it talks about that goodness is a euphemism for God. Now, this is not a class about, I don't want everybody to go out and start using euphemisms. I just want, I find it interesting that, that our culture has made goodness a euphemism for God. In the Hebrew culture, they were very, very afraid of using the name of God. The reason for that is, is that they are told in the second commandment not to take the Lord's name in vain. Uh, and so as they, we look at the Ten Commandments saying not to take His name in vain, actually the Third Commandment, then they were so afraid of misusing or taking His name in vain without even realizing they had done it, that many in the Jewish culture wouldn't say God. And so that's why if you look in the book of Matthew, most of the time when it talks about the kingdom of God, Matthew inserts the word heaven. Every once in a while he'll have kingdom of God, but Luke and Mark, they'll talk about the kingdom of God. But Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience, and the Jewish audience was very afraid of misusing God's name, and so they regularly used heaven as a euphemism for God. So instead of saying kingdom of God, they would say kingdom of heaven. So I bring that back to us that I find it really interesting that in our culture we use goodness as a euphemism for God. Because goodness is a very good description of God. Now there are a lot of folks that write in this area called systematic theology. Don't worry, you don't have to remember that word for tonight. Richard had to once upon a time, okay? But all that means is systematic theology is studying what the whole Bible says about any subject. So like if you wanted to know, if you wanted to know more about Jesus, what does the whole Bible say about Jesus? Or if you wanted to study heaven, what does the whole Bible say about heaven? And any book that deals with systematic theology is going to start with God. Who is God? And what are the attributes that make up God? Now let me just, just kind of segue from that. Erickson in his systematic Christian doctrine, he divides all the attributes of God using that prayer that we were taught as a kid. We never knew that we were getting ready for a college-level systematic theology class when we were memorizing, God is great, God is good, let us thank Him for our food. Because basically what he says is you can take all the attributes of God and you can put them into one of those two categories. 
Grudem in his commentary, and he, first of all, let me mention this. Erickson in his commentary, when he's talking, or in his theology, when he's talking about what goodness is, do you see what words he uses? Some of the attributes that he puts under goodness? Things like love and benevolence and grace and mercy and persistence. And what he means by persistence is persistence in love and grace. In other words, he doesn't give up on people. So I'm beginning to get you to thinking about what does it mean that God is good. Grudem lists that as one of his moral attributes and it, he lists it as the very first one. Cottrell lists it among his relational attributes. In other words, when he relates to people, he shows to people that he is good. And he highlights, I think very important, Exodus chapter 33. Does anybody know what's going on in Exodus chapter 33? What big, really sad, bad thing has just happened? In Exodus 20, you've got what I call the marriage on the mountain. God marries Israel. You've got the ten wedding vows that are proclaimed there. And then what happens while Moses is up on the mountain writing down the wedding vows for the ceremony? The bride is running around with the best man. Okay, they built a golden calf and started worshiping that golden calf. They were unfaithful to God even before they got through the wedding ceremony. And so Exodus 33 is in the aftermath of that where God says to Moses, listen, you go to the promised land. I made you guys a promise. I made your forefathers a promise. I'm going to give you this land flowing with milk and honey, but I'm not going with you. You've been unfaithful to me, and I don't need to be in your presence or I just might destroy you. And so Moses basically says to God, if you don't go with us, we don't need to go. Moses said, we'd rather be out here in the desert with you than in the promised land without you. And he says, if I, basically Moses is saying, if I'm going to lead this people, can you show me more of your glory? Can you help me to know you better? Then in Exodus 33, as God says He's going to let him see him, He says, I will allow my goodness to pass before you. And Contra, as he talks about what God's goodness implies, that as he pulls together Scripture, it implies that God is perfect, that God is desirable, that God is morally good, and that God is good to His creation. That He is caring and that He is loving. Now goodness is also one of the fruits of the Spirit. And as you look at that word that's translated goodness in our Bibles in the book of Galatians, it's only found four times in the New Testament. But I want you to look at, when you begin to define it, what words, you can see as well as I can, what words jump off the screen as embodying this idea of goodness? I'll get out of the way so you can see it. Just throw out some words that stand out to you. Nudge your neighbor, make sure they're awake. What stands out? I got energetic. What'd you... Beneficial. Beneficial, so you want to help others. What else? Generosity. Generosity. Positive. Positive. Active. Active. It is a desire to help others, to be generous, to help others, and it is active. It is not just a desire to help. It is a desire that is put into action. Okay? It is one thing to see, oh, she tripped and dropped all her books and her lunch tray. Isn't that sad? It's another thing to go over and help her clean it up, right? God is not only upset when He sees us stumble and fall, God goes and does something about it. That is implied in the concept of goodness. Goodness is an attitude and a desire to reach out based on love, to care for, to give, to be merciful to, to help others. And so if we were to kind of summarize it up, it describes a loving heart that is concerned for the welfare of others and looks for ways to be useful or helpful. So when we say God is good, one implication is that God is morally good. He does what is good and right. A, a, a word that would be a sister word to it would be the word righteous in that idea. But it also means that He is gracious 
and that he is kind and that he was, is helpful. Now, I don't know if y'all have seen this video. I think it's, it's been seen tons of times on the, on the web recently, but the video of the two dogs that were playing around the pool. Have any of y'all seen that one yet? Okay, the two dogs are playing around the pool and they're fighting and one of them's a little younger so he's usually the more rambunctious one. And so they're just wrestling like dogs and teenage boys do and they're wrestling and one of them falls in the pool. The problem is of the two dogs, one swims really well, one doesn't swim so well and as is always the case, the one that fell in the pool is the one that doesn't swim so well. So the reason we know all this has happened is the family, they have video cameras and so they, they kind of record the house in case somebody breaks in and all that fun stuff. So they see this later on their family surveillance, uh, surveillance video. So basically what happens is the one who can't swim real well falls in the water, okay? And the one that is up on the, the, the bank there starts barking and just going crazy and the one in the pool can't get out of the pool. So the one up on the side jumps in the pool, swims around behind him, and nudges him so he can get his paws up on the edge and crawl out of the pool. He saves his buddy's life. Okay? Now, that's the kind of dog I want. It is not the kind of dog that I have. I have two dogs, and they are the dumbest dogs on the face of the earth. But anyway, we won't go into that. All right? I'm not sure they know where the pool is. But the point is, that's goodness. That's goodness. Goodness desires to help. Goodness is an action word. Now, in our Bibles, we have 66 books. And each of those books are like a... I, I describe them as like a beautiful pearl in a pearl necklace. But what happens is, and while each of the pearls in a pearl necklace, it's beautiful all by itself, the pearls in a pearl necklace were meant to go together. And sometimes we so look at the books in the Bible in isolation that they, we forget they were meant to go together. That there is a thread that runs through them. Now as we go to Genesis chapter 1, it doesn't begin by trying to argue for the existence of God. It just assumes we know there is a God and proceeds forward. Remember Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. So it assumes, assumes that we believe there's a creator out there. It just starts by telling us how he created. Now I have a question for you. Why do you think God made the world? Do, do, do. Why do you think God made the world? Have you ever wrestled with that question? Is that the weirdest thing ever? You didn't know thinking was required tonight. Do I? Oh, we don't do it well. Oh, I know you guys are smart. Richard says you are. Have you ever thought about that? Why did God create? Do you think He was just bored? Do you think He was lonely? Maybe nobody loved him, so he thought, I'll just create something that'll love me. What do you think? Because I think we learn something about God, or we begin to, when we begin to wrestle with why he might have created. I would contend that God didn't create because he was lonely, God didn't create because he was unloved, God didn't create because he had no one to bow down and worship him. Job 38 talks about when God created the world. It talks about how the angels, the sons of God, rejoiced at the creation of the world. There are beings that pre-exist this planet. Okay, God was not alone when He made this planet. In John chapter 17, Jesus says, You loved me before the world began. So the Father loved the Son, and the Son loved the Father long before we human beings and this world came into existence. In Acts chapter 17, in that sermon that Paul preached on Mars Hill in Athens, a city with 10,000 residents and 30,000 gods represented. Their running joke was it was easier to meet a god or goddess than it was to meet a person in Athens. And as he's standing there and he sees this altar to an unknown God, in other words, just in case we left one out and he or she shows up, we can say, oh, 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 we didn't know your name, but there's your altar over there. He preaches a sermon based on that. And as he's talking about the temples all around them where they cared for the gods. I remember, I remember going to India 
and arriving during the Gamish festival. And they, they literally groomed and cared for and fed some of their gods and goddesses. I say all that to say this. It would have been similar in ancient Athens. And Paul said, our God doesn't dwell in temples. Now we know there was a temple in Jerusalem for a while. And we know there was an Ark of the Covenant. And we know there was a sense in which His presence was there. But you can't take the God of the universe and put Him in a box about this big. Okay, you can't reduce him to that. And he says he doesn't need a house. He doesn't need us to take care of him. Basically, the point of Paul's sermon is God is the source of all that we are and he needs absolutely nothing from us. So my point is, anything that I give to God, I'm just giving back something he gave to me. So if you gave me your Bible as a present... Thank you very much. That's so kind of you. You're so wonderful. You're, that's good. You're good, all right? And I, let's say, then I said, you know, and you're so nice. You sat on the front row. You didn't get like all those adults that are back row Christians. You came up front, and I said, since you've been such a good student, I'm going to give you a Bible. Now, aren't you impressed? Aren't I giving? I just gave her her Bible. Anything I give God, I'm just giving Him back what He gave me. So therefore, I'm, God doesn't get anything new out of me. He was being worshipped long before we arrived. He was, not, he was being loved long before we arrived. He was not lonely before we arrived. Then why might God have created? For me, it might go back to the nature of God. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 and verse 16, it says, God is... Love. God's love. And true, deep, abiding love seeks to express itself. It makes total sense to me that a being that loves would say, Man, I wish there were more beings out there to love. Creating a world filled with beings that He could love, that to me makes total sense. And the logical conclusion for me as to why God created ultimately might go back to the fact that God is love. Now, I believe God created the world out of love. And I believe the thread that runs through the Bible is God so loved. Now, John 3.16 is a theme of the Bible. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. But I, I want to, to throw out there to you that I contend that God not only so loved that He sent Jesus to die for our sins, but I contend that God so loved that He created us in the first place. And that when He made us, He had a plan for us, and part of that plan for us involved making us in His image. He only says that about the people. He doesn't say that about the cows. He doesn't say that about the antelope. He doesn't say that about the beetles. Only of the people does He say in His image. What do you think it might mean to be made in the image of God? Have you ever wrestled with that question? What might it mean to be made in His image? Talk to me. Okay, spiritually in His image. You mean like our spirit or just that we're, there's a spiritual connection? Our spirit, good. Yes, ma'am. Make us look like him, think like him, and feel like him. Okay, so thinking and feeling attributes, especially thinking and feeling. Okay. Human beings, animals think, but humans think at a higher level. Okay. You know, sometimes talk, folks talk about the percentage and how close human beings and uh, apes are, for example. But I'm telling you, it doesn't take just a little difference in DNA to make a huge leap in mental capability. All right? So no, no other creature thinks and feels at the level of a human being. What else? Because ultimately what ends up happening when you begin to wrestle with this is if he only says it of the human beings, then a natural starting place is how are the human beings different from the rest of the creation? And so often you'll hear things about like reasoning ability, like ability to communicate, ability to love, ability to feel at deeper levels, uh, the, uh, a soul that lives on. These are some of the things that often are, are put out there. 
uh, by folks who want to look at this and think about this. And I think there is validity to each of them and to each of the things you said. But what I want you to do is I want you to think about something a little bit beyond that. I want you to think about the concept of in His image. In the ancient world, I, rem I remember when I visited the Louvre in Paris and the British Museum in London, I remember going to the Egyptian section. I remember when the Ramesses II exhibit came to Memphis, Tennessee and seeing those statues, or I think about at, uh, in London seeing Amenhotep. When a pharaoh came into power, he would put images of himself all over the empire. Now, those images were not him. They were representations of him. But they let the people know who was in charge. They, those statues were made in his image to remind people that Pharaoh Amenhotep rules the empire. And so they were placed everywhere. We do the same thing today. If you were to go down to, to your local courthouse, my suspicion is you might see a pre picture of the governor or a picture of a mayor. You might see a picture of some of the local judges. You might see a picture of the President of the United States. It was the same way in the ancient, ancient world, except they didn't take digital pictures. They carved something or they painted something. And when they carved something, they called it an image. There to remind us of who was Pharaoh. Now why do I talk about that? Because when I understand how the word image was used in the ancient world, I find it fascinating that when God made the world, the God who is truly the ruler of all that is, He put in the creation images of Himself. You go to Exodus chapter 20, He says, Don't make any graven images, even ones of Me, because He's already made some. He made human beings in His image, not to be worshipped, but to reflect Him and to represent Him in the world. He told the human beings made in His image, all right, I started the creation, now I want you to continue the creation that I have started. I want you to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So I believe that a part of being made in God's image is reflecting God. There should be something of God's character and God's attitude, something of Him in me. That doesn't mean I'm God. That doesn't mean that you know people should start worshiping me or start worshiping you. But I, if God is good, if God does what, was, what is morally right, and I'm made in His image, then guess what I should be? I should be good. If God made a world and filled it with everything that we need, took care of our every need and provided for us, and even when we had struggles, He was there to help us because of His goodness, then if I'm made in His image and I am His representative in the world, that's what I should be and that's what I should do. I want you to recognize that when God made the world, He provided for everything that we might possibly need. We had a perfect world. When you get to the end of Genesis chapter 2, you have harmony between the human beings. You've got harmony between the human beings and the animals. Nobody's trying to eat at them. You've got harmonies between the human being and creation. It literally is a perfect world where we have everything we could want. Adam and Eve were not alone. They had helpers to help each other. They had all the food they could want. They had a purpose to, to do work that God had given them to do. They had everything they needed. Why do I mention that? That's an expression of God's goodness. God didn't have to create us. And when He made us, He didn't have to give us all of these things. But that's what goodness does. Goodness shows. But God also gave us a choice. Now why in the world would God give a choice? Why would God say, now listen, you can eat any of the trees, but don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Give me a quick answer. we just got a few minutes. Why do you think God gave the human beings a choice? Otherwise we'd be robots and capable of loving. Okay, so why does He care about that? Good answer. Remember, God is the designer of robots. God is 
love. And if God is love, and God seeks true love, then true love must be chosen and not programmed or forced. And so God made a decision. And with that decision comes a risk. God chose to make creatures who could choose to hate the God that is good to Him. And in Genesis chapter 3, they chose not to listen to the God who had been good to them. They instead listened to Satan who planted doubt. And then he came right out and lied and said, God doesn't care about you. He's not telling you the whole truth. He's actually just jealous and afraid that you'll become like him. And so the human beings, having been given everything by this benevolent God, fell prey to the temptations of the devil and instead listened to the Satan that was trying to destroy them instead of the God who was trying to help them and was trying to save them. And all the beautiful things that God had made in Genesis 1 and 2 in some way were broken. The relationship between human beings, the relationship between human beings and the created world, and the relationship with God. But even as God was basically confronting and calling out Adam and Eve, What have you two done? Well, it was that woman you gave me. It's her fault. Well, it wasn't me. It was that snake over there. And even as they're blaming someone else and God is confronting them for their sin, He's giving them hope. He said, there's a day coming. You see this woman that you've tempted, serpent? There's a day coming when one of her descendants is going to throw down on you and He's going to bust your head wide open. And it's one of over 400 prophecies in the Bible about Jesus. Even as the human beings were turning against God, God was pointing to a day when He was going to fix the mess that they had made. And their mess gets worse and worse till by the time you get to the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11, instead of them reflecting God and living in His image and living for His glory and being fruitful, multiplying and filling the earth, they're saying, hey man, let's make some glory for ourselves. Let's all stay together. Instead of multiplying and fill the earth, let's all stay right here so that we can have power and so that we can build this great city to the heavens so we can glorify ourselves. And literally, they have turned the world upside down. There was a fighter pilot who was flying maneuvers at night testing out new hardware. The pilot could not, there were no ground lights, so all the pilot had was what was inside the instrumentation panel to determine what was up and what was down. The pilot pulled back on the joystick to go skyward and slammed into the ground because the pilot did not realize that the jet was flying upside down. Since Genesis chapter 3, the world has been flying upside down. And they've been flying upside down so long that when people like Paul came along telling about Jesus and how Jesus shows us what God intended us to be, they thought they were turning the world upside down. When the reality is that what God has been trying to do is turn the world right side up. In Genesis 1 through 3 and even 1 through 11, you see a God that made a world to give us everything we could possibly want. And we messed it up. But He didn't quit. And over and over, whether it was with the flood or whether it was after the Tower of Babel, and you can just march on through the stories of the Bible, the God who is good was persistent. And He never gave up on the human beings. And the story of the Bible is the story of God trying to bless the earth through a descendant of Abraham and a descendant of Eve through Jesus Christ. The story of the Bible is God over and over loving us in spite of our faults, loving us in spite of our mistakes, and pointing to a Messiah who would show us what it means to live in the image of God, to show us what it truly means to live with goodness. Goodness shows. As we talk about discovering God's goodness, God shows us Himself through the world and through the Word. God is morally good 
God is gracious and He is kind and He is helpful. God has shown His goodness in the creation. He has shown His goodness in Jesus Christ. But one of the fruits of the Spirit is goodness, which means God wants to show His goodness through the Christians. We know that the creation showed God's goodness. We know that Christ shows God's goodness. The question is, will we? When our youth and family majors retire or retire, I guess it's kind of like retiring, when they graduate, I give them a baton. And it refers, it says, it's your turn, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, where Paul tells Timothy to take the things that he's learned and pass it on to others. Richard never got his, so tonight I bring you your baton. And the reason, I I grew up running track and cross country, so I can remember those days, though I was a distance runner, there was only one meet a year that we got to pass batons as distance guys. But I want you to think about that. God is good. But the message of the Bible is that He's passed the baton to us. And He says, you continue the race. I started the creation, you continue the creation. I showed you how to live in goodness. Now go be my presence in the world. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the wonderful young people that are here tonight and the adults who are invested in their lives and love them. Bless them, bless each of us. Help us to be your presence in the world. Father, help us not to live upside down, but right side up. Help us to live in goodness, to live like you, and to love like you. In the name of your Son we pray. Amen.